Sounds good. And now, now, the, now they now our attendees can enter, and I will put up on the screen the image for the event, and I'll start. I'll stop that as soon as you want to start. Charlotte, can folks hear me? Yes, everyone can hear. Everyone can hear you. Um, I guess we could start then. Um, welcome, everyone, and please feel free to introduce yourself on the chat. My name is Jordan Winquist. I'm with the National Lawyers Guild. Um, I'm the chair for the Environmental Human Rights Committee. Um, my colleague, Natalie Segovia, just signed on. She's the chair for the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Committee of the National Lawyers Guild. Um, I'm here in Philadelphia in Lenape Hoking. My name's, or we're very excited to have our four featured panelists um, tonight for the webinar. Um, we'll go right into it. I first want to introduce Leola, um, Leola Hiron, Leola Cowboy Hiron. Uh, Leola is Diné from the Saltwater Clan. She worked with the Red Nation Coalition and testified before the IHRC on issues around Standing Rock. She's also a uh, WPLC organizer, the Water Protectors Legal Collective. We have two members from the WPLC featured as, as presenters today. Um, and she's in Albuquerque and went to University of New Mexico. We have several panelists who studied there at some point. Um, and I'll leave it to you, Leola, to start us off. I think you're and muted. And I think we've got Leola muted. Yeah. Thank you, Jordan. And I think Leona and Jacqueline will be joining us shortly just for other folks. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Yat a Leola Kalboyanisha. 
Um, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I am honored and I just would like to do a land acknowledgement. I'm sitting upon the Tila lands of our Pueblo relatives here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so I was brought on this panel to talk about how the fossil fuel industry is impacting my community and the work I do. So um, I am with the Water Protector Legal Collective. I'm actually um, the executive director. And I came upon this work back when I was doing my undergrad at UNM. And as an indigenous woman, you know, Albuquerque is a border town, right? We live in a very violent area as indigenous people. We are constantly targeted, right? So I came upon in this work when I saw my and myself, like my relatives being targeted. We had a lot of unsheltered relatives and um, it was really upsetting for to see the to see state repression, right? It, state repression is always, it's always here, but it's just not visible, right? It's, it's, it's like hidden in different ways and maybe not everybody realizes that. And that's how I started organizing within the community. And I just want to acknowledge and honor that the work that I've been doing today and in the past, that's all been mentored and fostered and given to me by indigenous organizers, right? It was people on the ground, we worked together to do this work because we see the oppressions in these systems that are supposed to help us and not realizing that these, these systems are very oppressive. And so really just like calling those out. Um, so the fossil fuel industry has devastated and impacted my communities in so many different ways. It's taken you know, our clean water away from us. It has taken our land, our sacred sites, um, like Chaco Canyon here in New Mexico and our people's lives are at stake now, right? Because we are getting, our relatives are getting sick. Um, so more recently, how I got involved in the Standing Rock work was a delegation of us went to Standing Rock back in 2016. And because of the organizing work I was doing here in New Mexico and the surrounding area, I was able to use those skills in Standing Rock in being called as a relative to help and protect the water, right? So it was an amazing time, but it was also a very awakening time to look at state repression on a magnified level, right? Because we were being watched in so many ways. We were being called terrorists. Um, just the amount of militarization, it was, it was just unreal, unrealistic, really. And, but also being so conscious because we're there, right? And we're seeing these things and we're just, we don't know what to do, but then we're, we have to get the word out to people. So what we did too is um, record these things happening so that we do have proof of, of what is going on. We came as prayerful people. We came with our prayers. We came with our medicine. We came with our local water and we came to stop a pipeline. That's what it was. And being targeted as violent people, it was just really surprising, but not surprising, right? Um, because capitalism is what, like, I'm here to dismantle and heteropatriarchy. So 
basically after camp was taken away from us, um, something crazy just happened. And that was the person that I married was targeted and indicted. And we didn't know what to do. We really didn't know what to do. And we reached out to our community and found him a lawyer and I became a part of that legal defense team. And what we did was work with a group of lawyers, legal workers, investigators, and it was a profound moment because we're indigenous people and our voices needed to be heard on the level of care that my husband and the other federal defendants need. And they still need, right? We still have no DAPL political prisoners in prison today. And I honor them. Thank you so much, Red Fawn. Thank you. Thank you, Radler, Angry Bird, Dion, Little Feather for the sacrifices that you made to keep me safe in camp, to keep my family safe in camp, to keep my relatives safe in camp. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's how I became part of the, the legal collective is I started off as a volunteer and really using those organizing skills to become like really wedging myself in there, right? And the, the Water Protector Legal Collective, I honor them because they, made a space for me and fostered me, mentored me, and showed me how to do this work. And it is so powerful to be able to be a part of this work when we're so reliant on our white comrades to do this work for us, right? Because you go in any legal setting and it's, it's there's so many of our white allies there, right? And maybe not white allies. And what I've come to realize is that there are so many of us who can do this work ourselves. We can do this legal work ourselves. We can do this lawyering ourselves. We can do this investigating ourselves. So I really empower our communities to voice and say, I want to do this work and let us know and we can figure out a way how to make this happen. I'm not here for myself. I'm not here for my self gain. I believe in what we do. And that's the reason why I sit here today as a director in the Water Protector Legal Collective. We value and I honor all of the water protectors that we've um, provided legal defense for and the people till today, you know, in between that time that we've done visited their homelands and done know your rights training and all those great other things that we've done and been invited to do, right? And I've learned a lot in this time and it now is my time to give back those skills to our communities. And I'm really honored to, to be able to do this work. And you know, the things that have, there's so many people, right? Like. Standing Rock was that ignition that was igniting our spirits on fire. Like we are on fire. We are flamed up, ready to do this work and dismantle this oppressive system, right? And it's every single system. It's not just one. All these systems have be like the legal system, right? We don't find justice here, but we, you, we have to learn the law in order to use it to, to like, to, we have to learn the law in order to like to get some type of justice for us or to like maneuver through it and redefine what justice means to us, right? And it's really empowering when I see my own people doing the work, right? And being given this space to do the work. And that's what WPLC does. So I'm really like honored to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this. And I just want to, you know, also acknowledge there are so many people standing up and keep doing it. Keep doing it. We need more people. We need the young ones to understand what critical infrastructure bills are, right? And how to step up to their legislation to go to legislation and talk to senators, talk to their local representatives and tell them, no, we do not want critical infrastructure bills being passed, right? What does that mean? How do you testify? We have those answers for you. We can help 
and support you to do this, to do this work. Um, and also, I just want to acknowledge that when the Standing Rock movement happened, we do have people who were severely charged, right? We did provide legal support for over 800 water protectors and acknowledging them. Thank you so much for your sacrifices. But today, those most severely charged are the no dapple political prisoners that I named earlier. And we need to never forget them, right? We never, we never forget them. Please always acknowledge them. Because when I was doing this work, I got the privilege and the honor to be invited by one of the federal defendants investigators to go to Minnesota and look at the archives there on the wounded knee and what happened in wounded knee. And that was a really, like I could look at those indictments and it almost mirrors what happened in Standing Rock and looking at those indictments. There's a lot of things like, there's a lot of things that we don't talk about because these charges are so new, right? We learned so much. And, you know, one day these political prisoners will be able to tell their story. And I just wanna make sure that nobody forgets them and they are being honored in this time, right? And this is an important time because these, these pipelines are being forced to shut down, right? Dakota Access Pipeline, has a timeline, a deadline they have to meet. And right now that means let's honor these political prisoners and the sacrifices they made. I think that's all I have. Um, you know, another thing I wanted to mention was the federal oppression that's happening in Turtle Island you know, that comes in many different forms and ways. And here we, like I said, I'm in Albuquerque and Operation Legend has just been announced. And that is highly problematic as a indigenous woman who we're already facing police violence and they wanna bring in almost 200 federal officers when I'm not sure why, I'm not sure exactly what's going on. They think that we need to be controlled. Thank you, Leola. Um, I don't know if Michelle or Leona have a preference to go next. And also Leola, thank you for sharing the, you know, the personal story from Standing Rock. I appreciate sharing, that's very deep. Um, yeah, thank you for this time. Do either of the other presenters have a preference to go first or go next? Um, then I'll, I'll s oh, sorry, you're both on mute, so I can't hear you. Um, let's see. I'm pointing my lips at, at, at Miss Morgan. I, okay. I think, I think we're, we're dancing around each other. So I'm, I'll, I can go next, that's no problem. Sure, let me introduce you really quickly. Um, I've met Leona at the Uranium Film Festival in Quebec City. Uh, five years ago, sorry, it wasn't the Uranium Film Festival, it was the World Uranium Sy Symposium that I think came out of the film festival. Um, Leona is co-founder of Dene No Nukes. She's also co-founder of Nuclear Issue Study Group and is a Dene community organizer studying both, researching both uranium and CIS. Um, she's working on nuclear colonialism since 2007 and with that is working on stopping new, new uranium development, transporting radioactive materials and nuclear waste dumping. And the new, she works a lot on the nuclear, nuclear tests in the Southwest area since 1945, which is called a nuke cemetery. So go ahead, Leona, thank you. Um, thank you, Jordan. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if may, maybe I didn't um, send a proper bio. I, don't really work on the nuke cemetery. I did, uh, but I would be happy to talk about all things uh, nuclear. Actually, I, I also uh, have a. Uh, I just wanted to to start off first to say thank you to Leola and uh, Michelle and and all the indigenous women here. I haven't met Jacqueline or 
Natalie in person yet or Charlotte, but um, thank you all for the work that you do. And um, I was told, I think we got 10 minutes. Is that right? So I'm just gonna set my little timer here. Um, I have been working on issues related to uranium mining and um, that started off uh, when I was, um, after I graduated from college. So I usually just, I tell this story, I'll, I'll try to make it brief, but um, when, when I was in college, I also went to UNM, like uh, Leola. We, um, my family is from Northwestern New Mexico, actually from the Chaco area. I don't talk about it much. I've never been to Chaco because we were told not to go there. But um, yeah, my house is, my future home is probably 20 miles from the actual Chaco. Yeah, so I'm really happy for everyone who's stopping um, the fracking out there and working on other issues. I have not worked on uranium mining issues in a while. And um, I feel a little bit bad about that sometimes because um, as an indigenous person, my roots in the fight really are based in um, our homelands and, and what's going on within the four sacred mountains. But um, since like 2014, um, I've been working much beyond those four sacred mountains and, and actually traveling all over the world um, because of the issue of nuclear waste. Um, so, so just going back to my, my story, how I got into this, um, my family uh, lives in the Northwestern part of New Mexico. There was a lot of uranium mining in the past. And um, uh, back in um, 2006, the price of uranium went very high very quickly. And so that um, attracted a lot of the old companies to, to try to restart and um, the uranium boom that occurred was like from the late 40s, 1950s-ish to about the late 70s, early 80s. So there's not a lot of uranium mining happening today. Um, on, our, on our land, the tribe, uh, the, the, the Navajo Nation makes a law against uranium mining. Um, but, but because of colonization and the way um, the United States stole our land and the different laws that they created. Um, there today, there's a lot of um, uh, interesting uh, legal jurisdictions out out on the land. So, like for example, um, we're dealing with what's called Indian allotments, um, and and um, the Navajo Nation as a whole is is not like one contiguous land mass. There's there's some there's a few islands. Uh, not attached. There's a, a lot of holes within the Navajo Nation of private land. This is where you usually find churches and, and liquor stores or mining um, and extractive industry. So they're really good at finding those pockets of um, private land to, to target. So anyways, the uranium mining um, that I was fighting back in 2006, it started because um, I found out that uranium is connected to cancer and different health problems. And a lot of my family were getting cancer. My grandma died of lung cancer and nobody knew why. And um, so I connected this to the uranium and I'm pretty sure my grandmother must have uh, inhaled an alpha particle and then it probably disintegrated in her lung and just you know, kept exposing her to radiation. Um, so this, the, the, there's a lot of horrible stories that I've heard about the impacts from uranium to humans and animals. Um, I'm not really sure how the plants are, but um, the other issue is that there's a uranium on one of our sacred mountains, which is Mount Taylor, um, or we say Tsotsur. So um, there's a lot of reasons why uranium is, why we don't want uranium. I mean, there's health reasons and, and environmental um, uh, you know, contamination that we don't want. But um, right now, there's a little bit of a push for mining again um, because of this thing that th this idea that people think it's uh, low carbon. So this is the big thing I wanted to kind of focus on today. But um, long story short, I learned about uranium mining after I graduated from college. Even though I went to high school in Gallup, New Mexico, um, Gallup, New Mexico is right next to Church Rock, where the world's largest uranium spill happened on July 16th. So right now, um, it's July 23rd, uh, about a week ago, well, exactly a week ago, um, I had organized a webinar um, with some folks uh, to talk about July 16th 
because this year is the 75th anniversary of the first use of a nuclear weapon on Japan. But the thing is, people forget that the first nuclear weapon that was ever detonated was in New Mexico. And so that was the Trinity test. And then there was like almost a thousand underground tests at, um, in Nevada affecting the Western Shoshone. And then of course the Marshall Islands. So all of the uranium mining and the exploitation, um, you know, how that, how um, the, 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 the taking of our land and, you know, the railroad, how all of these tools of colonization have kind of, you know, they kind of have paved the way for, for nuclear colonialism. And then you add in all of the weapons testing on indigenous people's lands. Um, that's another way that, you know, it pushes people off the lands. And it's, it's, it's a form of what uh, my friend Klee Benali calls a slow genocide. So um, from the impacts of all of this stuff, you know, we, we are still dealing with what happened, you know, in 1945, the bombs of, on Japan and then Trini the Trinity test. Um, but the thing I really wanted to emphasize to folks today is that uranium, while we're talking about Japan and in, in the work that I do, a lot of the focus this year is, is on the weapons, um, but we can't, we can't separate that from the, the issues of the energy development. And so um, I'm gonna, just gonna show a couple pictures real quick here. Um, my screen always, I lose my zoom. I don't know if I can, uh, it's always hard for me to share my screen because it takes over my whole thing, but I'm just going to show a couple pictures real quickly. Um, in Church Rock, New Mexico, let's see, can you all see that? It's, it's a, that's, I don't know, someone, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an aerial view. Um, so this is the Church Rock area north of, it's north of Church Rock in a, in a place called Redwater Pond Road Community. So I think we lost it. We had the visual, but now I don't see it. It's all oh, black. Dear. Okay. You, you had it for an instant there. That's good. Okay. Is it, can, you can see something now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, this is my uh, low tech way to show it. Anyways, um, so the, let me blow it up here. Whoa, that's a lot. So basically there's a community that lives close to um, where this world's largest uranium spill was. This um, in the bottom right hand corner here, you see it says Redwater Pond Road Community. Um, these little white dots here, and there's some black dots, these are houses, and they're right between two uranium mines. So these are abandoned mines. In the United States, we have 15,000 abandoned uranium mines uh, because there was no laws to clean them up when they first happened. So here's one here, and then here's another one here. So you can see the community is literally right between the two of them. So these two mines were taking their uranium ore over here to the mill. So the mill is where they process it. And then they were storing the waste uh, on this side um, where this yellow circle is. There was a big um, pond of waste, uh, liquid waste. And on the morning of July 16th, that, um, there was a little dam that was holding all that waste in that broke. And then it went through this waterway, it went to the Puerco River and then flowed into Arizona. So this is, uh, yeah, this is something that we're still dealing with. And so when people talk about, you know, nuclear energy, I try to remind folks like, there's still folks that live out there all over the country living next to abandoned mines that are not cleaned up. Um, the community started this day of remembrance. Um, so this is the, from 2009, this was on the 30th anniversary um, this one is like, I think this was last year, but um, one of the things that um, the organizer who, who does a lot of this work, she's right here, her name is Edith Hood. She has been talking to the government about um, getting uh, uh, some houses built to replace you know, their houses which have been contaminated and they still haven't done that. They said it's too expensive to build a road up to where they want to make their house and that, that it's too expensive to extend the electric, electrical lines. And so she, she often says she thinks that the government is just like literally waiting for her to die before they address that issue. So I just wanted to spend um, most of my time talking about July 16th because the anniversary just passed. The, that happened in 1940, um, I'm sorry, 1979. 
So it's the it's the 44, 41st anniversary this year of that spill. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's kind of uh, just to show folks about the uranium mining issue. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one more minute, if I can, and I'm going to show another picture here. Um, we are dealing with right now this, this uh, issue of nuclear waste. I don't know if you all can see my screen again. It's, it's a map. Can someone confirm that? You yeah, you're good. That? Looks good. Cool. Okay. So right now, we're dealing with a company called Holtec that wants to bring waste from every single nuclear reactor in the country. So all these pink circles are the different reactors. And the idea, there's nowhere to put it. There, the idea was to take it to uh, Yucca Mountain in Nevada, but that's, that's not gonna happen. So what they're saying is they wanna bring all of it to New Mexico and Texas. There's two proposals right now. We're actually in the middle of a comment period for uh, the, draft environmental, the draft environmental impact statement for both of them. Um, the deadlines are in September and November, and I can send information to you all if you can help us to send some comments. But um, the idea is that they're just going to store it here temporarily. So what they're saying is um, maybe for 100 years. And then by 100 years, they will figure out what to do with that waste. And um, this is in an area where it's, there's a, um, an oil boom. So right now, there's a lot of, um, you can see the, the, zoom, the zoom in view. Um, this is right near other nuclear in industry, uh, WIP. Um, there's some uh, a enrichment facility and other things, but it's also right in the middle of the Permian Basin where they're doing a lot of oil drilling. And so um, the reason why this is happening right now is because a lot of the power plants are beginning to shut down. They're getting old, they all need to shut down, and, and there's nowhere to put the waste. The United States never figured this out. They've literally been hitting a snooze bar from the 80s to, to the 90s and then now, and there's still nowhere to put the waste. So we're saying, leave it where it's at, leave it at the power plants until there's a permanent place. There's no reason to bring it to New Mexico. And, and we know if they bring it here, it's probably never gonna move again. So this is the biggest issue happening right now. And the reason um, I'm bringing it up is because obviously uranium is a fuel for both weapons and nuclear waste. But now we have like AOC and Joe Biden saying that you know, nuclear is going to be part of this solution to, to curb climate change. So we really need um, help to, to stop these things because as I showed you with the pictures of what, uh, you know, our relatives are dealing with from the past uranium boom, um, this is just creating more problems for us in, in the places like where uranium mining happens. It's, it's indigenous lands all over the world. And so when people say, oh, it's low carbon, it's clean energy, um, they obviously don't know anything about uranium mining. They've obviously never lost people to, to, to the cancers and, and the sicknesses that are caused by uh, exposure to radiation or, you know, or have seen babies born with, with, with severe problems and, and that kind of thing. So um, it's totally an EJ issue. It, there's you know, all kinds of issues. It, when we fight these things, it, it crosses so many other issues like reproductive justice, food sovereignty, water security, you know, in addition to energy and health and environmental justice. And of course, the biggest one is genocide. So I'll just leave you with that. And um, thank you. I think I went a little bit over, but thank you so much for inviting me today. Thanks, Leona. Uh, thanks for sharing your personal story as well. And thanks for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> next, we have Michelle Cook, um, another um, Diné member uh, from the Navajo Nation. Um, Michelle is from the uh, Honagani clan and she's worked with the Navajo Human Rights Commission. And earlier in her studies, she had a Fulbright to attend Aotearoa in New Zealand. She's also a founding member of the Water Protector Legal Collective. And has worked with WeCan, which is the Women's Earth Climate Action Network on the intersectionality uh, and on an intersectional indigenous led divestment campaign. She's, I believe, currently studying a doctor of juridical science at University of Arizona 
and she's also been before the IACHR, the UN, and has been abroad to Greenland, Australia, and many others. So go ahead, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Yat Aish A. Michelle Kutlinish, Hanagahi Nishlint, Bilagana Buses Chin, Tolbahi Dashich A. Bilagana Dashinali. My name is Michelle Cook. I am born of the one who walks around you clan of the Dene Nation, and this is how I identify myself as a Dene woman. I am so honored and thankful for the invitation uh, to be on this panel surrounded by so many incredible Indigenous women and leaders in our community. Both Layola and Miss Morgan um, have done incredible work that I'm familiar with and um, we're so proud of the work that they have done for the Navajo Nation. I know that they don't hear that enough, but if we don't have the, the tribal grassroots people who are fighting uh, for our human rights, um, we just won't be able to cover all the needs. So I'm so thankful that we have women um, who are standing up in so many different ways to fill in those gaps. Um, and to protect our tribal people and community. So I'm so thankful to be here. Um, yeah, my name is Michelle Cook. Um, I'm a human rights lawyer and I'm the founder of Divest and Best Protect, which is an indigenous led divestment campaign um, for fossil fuel divestment and decolonization with banks, credit rated, rating agencies and insurance companies. Um, and so, you know, right now, all over the world, there's indigenous peoples who are in extreme and urgent danger as a result of extracted industries all over the world. And, you know, up until, you know, last year, we we're re receiving reports from groups like Gro Global Witness, where 300 or more human rights, indigenous rights defenders are being murdered um, in the global south as a result of their defense um, of their lands, territories, and resources. And so when we talk about extraction industries, um, we also really need to understand the, the very long historical role that in, extractive industries have played in facilitating genocide and facilitating colonization, not only from the 15th century, 17th century, 1800s into into the present day. And so it's, I think it's very important for all of us to remember that this is something that has been going on for quite some time and that the extractive industries are part of the DNA, if you will, of colonization. You can't really have one without the other. And so we really have to deconstruct the extractive industry, not only in a historical way, but in a contemporary way on all of the levels that it impacts our lives and in all the ways that we're able to, um, you know, create leverage. So for example, you know, all of these corporations and all of these um, uh, industries are financed, right? All wars are financed and that includes, included the Indian wars, right? When, when the US military was fighting uh, Native American people, right? George Washington said, it's better just to do treaties with the Indians because war is too expensive, right? And so with, there's always been this ongoing war um, with our peoples and it continues today. Um, and the banks and the insurance companies and the financial industry, they play a part. They pay for the extractive industries to invade our land. And so while they often remain hidden we, we really need to expose and bring this financial tie to light. And I know yesterday we got some really great news that um, Zurich Insurance, a very large, large, large billion, billion dollar company, um, uh, is no longer going to be providing insurance to Trans Mountain. And so that's an incredible victory for indigenous peoples all throughout um, British Columbia who have fought um, the Trans Mountain Pipeline that is um, invading their territory without the consent of indigenous peoples who live there. Um, and so that's just one angle that I think that we can look at is with the insurance companies. And, and we were, um, the, the Divest 
Invest Protect delegations were able to go to Zurich Insurance in Zurich, Switzerland and present risk assessment reports and to, to contribute to the advocacy effort. So I'm very thankful for all the women um, in the cohort um, that have participated in the Indigenous Women's Divestment Delegation for their work um, in securing that victory as well. Um, I think also, what I think is also important here is, you know, anytime we also talk about extraction, we have to talk about colonization, but we also have to talk about militarization and policing and enforcement, right? Because who is going to enforce the will of the corporation? Right, and, and that's when policing and militarization and the force of the state um, comes to bear. And that's what we saw in 2016. And in 2016 in Standing Rock, we saw um, the use of excessive force by the police on unarmed uh, protesters exercising their First Amendment rights. And we saw the, the extent of violence and excessive force that was used um, to the point where we still have tribal members who are suffering permanent um, physical injuries um, as a result of being shot with so-called non-lethal weapons. Um, and so, you know, we were able to see four years ago really what it looked like when the United States went to war essentially on itself. And, it, and in North Dakota, it went to war for oil against not only indigenous peoples, but against all of the American people who said no to this illegal pipeline. Um, and so, you know, in 2016, when we began to write and document the, the human rights abuses that we observed um, in Standing Rock, um, we, we've, so far we've submitted to four different um, bodies within the United Nations in, in Loyola, was able to come with me on the delegation to Jamaica, to the Inter-American Commission, to testify on the use of force um, and criminalization against indigenous peoples, where we were face to face with the State Department, the United States of America's representative at the State Department, several men, and we reiterated to them the UN recommendations that were made in 2016 by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples when she studied the United States of America, that the United States the Justice, Department of Justice needed to investigate the use of force in Standing Rock. We still have not had an investigation into the use of force in 2016, right? And so when I see what's happening today, you know, of course, militarization is not not new, but when I see what's happening today, I see, you know, the past of what we saw in 2016, especially even now with the use of private security actors, right? And so that again is, is another human rights violation that we documented that, we've, that the United States is aware of. The United States is aware of this violation that it occurred in 2016 with Tiger Swan, but yet we have had no investigation. Um, and so we told you so, you know, indigenous peoples told you so, experienced what this was, ha what was happening. And we have asked the United Nations, the Inter-American Commission, the Special Rapporteur, the United, Human, the United Nations Human Rights Council, Council, and the Universal Periodic Review. Those are all of the bodies that we have taken this exact kind, this exact type of human rights evidence to and have appealed to at least give us an investigation. And we still have not had that. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that with what, we're, what is occurring today um, with the um, deployment of federal agents and the, the abduction of US citizens by un, un, unnamed federal agents, that this will reach the level of the United Nations to the point that we will have international outcry to pressure and shame the United States for the use of force and, and, for the, and for the human rights violations which is occurring to all of our people now, um, not just Native American people. Um, so I think those are um, things that we can learn from. Um, and, and I think also if folks want to learn more about that private security 
um, information. There's a report by the Human, right, uh, Human Rights Council that was published in July 20, 2019 that's called the relationship between private military security companies and the extractive industries from a human rights perspective. And the citation is A slash HRC slash 42 slash 42. And this, this document emerged because of the outcry of Standing Rock. So we have information and precedent that the United States of America can act on right now to end this type of abuse from private security actors. And when we were in Jamaica, what the State Department told us, women, myself, Casey Camp, Ophelia Rivas, and uh, Leola Cowboy, was that the United States takes uh, the, the right of protest very seriously, and, and we adhere to human rights. They also said that the United States um, encourages companies to adhere to the voluntary principles on human rights. The voluntary principles on human rights. And, and that's, that's about as much as we got. And to which we replied to the State Department, these are voluntary principles. And the companies that are abusing the human rights are not voluntarily um, adhering to them. So what is your duty, United States of America, to hold these companies liable, right? And in terms of extractive industries right now, extractive industries are operating as an, in an impunity zone. Impunity. No one is keeping these corporations accountable. The only people who are really keeping the corporations accountable is the grassroots movement of people who are going out there and saying no. And we also, of course, have the court challenges to the permitting. Um, but we see that even the rule of law in the United States is not sufficient to stop them. And we have gone all over the world seeking justice and help. And show me where in international law and show me here in the United States Show me where they, where they give the people justice, indigenous peoples. I don't see it anywhere. So to me, the extractive industry problem presents all of us with a very real issue of how do we keep them accountable in an impunity zone? How do we keep the state accountable and to put pressure on these companies to stop the murders? to stop the disappearances. Um, and so we have a lot to do, and I think that it challenges our work as movement lawyers or as lawyers or as human rights advocates, as grassroots advocates. How do we bring corporate accountability? How do we bring justice to indigenous peoples? And, and that's really what I think our, the Divest Invest Pro, uh, Protect platform is about. And that's really the core question that we are trying to get at and answer at the University of Arizona with the Indigenous Human Rights and Corporate Accountability Program that we are building. We want to learn how are we going to do this, where are the problems, and what do we need to do as, as a world community, as a world community to keep banks accountable, to keep these corporations accountable. And um, I, I know that there's a multi-tactical um, answer to that, um, but I'm certain that that challenging capitalism and its role historically in colonization and its role now in its destruction of indigenous peoples and the earth is central to all of our liberation and all of our well-being on this planet. Um, so I'm thankful to, to be here. I'm thankful for all the people who continue to teach me about this work, um, for all the people who continue, continue to um, help me to be humble. Um, and I know that we're all in this together and that it's difficult times right now. Uh, but, you know, our indigenous peoples are strong. We come from warriors. We are the children of Geronimo, of Lozin, of Manuelito, we are the strong original peoples and no matter what comes, we will be able to defend ourselves. And 
I'm thankful for all of you all here and uh, looking forward to learning more. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Wow, that was powerful. Um, really appreciate the badass, radical indigenous women we have here today and they're delivering in their presentations. Um, so our next, pre our next presenter is Jacqueline, who's just about to join us by video and we'll have translation from Natalie from Spanish to English. Um, I'll introduce her really quickly if that's okay, Natalie. Sure, that's fine. Um, this, is, this next presenter, this next and last presenter is Jackie Romero Epiayu. She is a human rights defender in the Department of Guajira in the northeast of Colombia near the border with Venezuela. Um, <clears throat> She is YU. She uh, works on visibilizing and denouncing violations of human rights defenders. And a lot of her work is fighting mining, mining mega projects, which displace the folks there, <clears throat> folks who are already vulnerable and victims, victims of the armed conflict and militarization in the area. She's a front lines defender. And I saw recent, um, by the way, the YU are the most numerous indigen indigenous group in Colombia and the extraction projects are involved coal, gas, and minerals in that area. And I saw recently that with the group Terra Just, Terra, Terra Justa, Terra Justa, um, Jacqueline was brought on a speaking tour in Ireland um, about the Cerejon mine. So go ahead, Natalie and Jacqueline. Thank you and welcome. Bienvenido. Muchísimas gracias. Para traducirle a Jacqueline Romero, muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros en este día. Eh, Jordan, quien es el, el chair también del de el, el Comité de Derechos Humanos Medioambientales, le da la bienvenida y le damos la bienvenida a usted, Jacqueline Romero, como el líder de la comunidad Guayú. Um, aquí tenemos un mapa. I hope everybody can see this. Uh, we do have a map of uh, La Guajira on screen, so hopefully folks can see that. Tenemos un mapa como usted lo solicitó y adelante yo lo voy a traducir. Hola, eh, un fraternal saludo desde territorio Guayú. Yo soy Jacqueline Romero, eh, del pueblo Guayú, así como lo están viendo en el mapa, al norte de Colombia. Eh, encabezando este hermoso territorio, pero también con mucho sufrimiento, que es nuestro pueblo. El pueblo Guayú es de los 102 pueblos indígenas en Colombia, el más numeroso. Agradecer eh, a las hermanas indígenas de eh, los otros pueblos que están aquí y a toda la audiencia que hoy están conectados para compartir en esta nueva eh, forma también de trabajar desde la virtualidad, que es un reto también para las comunidades indígenas. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Jacqueline Romero. I am from the Wayu peoples of the north of Colombia. It's a beautiful country, although also with so many different issues. Um, it's one of 102 indigenous nations in Colombia, although it's the most numerous uh, in the whole Colombian territory. I'm very happy to be here with you and I greet also the other uh, strong, beautiful women, uh, indigenous women that are here today. Adelante. Bueno, yo creo que si hacemos una radiografía de lo que es la situación de los pueblos indígenas a nivel global, lo que vamos a encontrar en materia de impactos eh, frente al extractivismo que se vive hoy en nuestros territorios, creo que vamos a encontrar situaciones muy similares, ¿no? En el departamento de La Guajira, que es en la zona donde yo me ubico, eh, y hago parte también de un movimiento de hombres y mujeres eh, guayú, Fuerza de Mujeres Guayú, que somos un proceso organizativo para defender el territorio, ¿no? So, if we do a, a global survey, I think of all of the impact of extractive industry um, worldwide, I think that we find that as indigenous peoples, we find ourselves in similar situations. Um, in the area of the Guajira, I form part of an organization called Fuerza Mujeres Guayú. Um, it's actually an organization that's made up of not just women, but also men that are fighting to, um, for our territories, our ancestral lands, and um, Yes, our, our territories and ancestral lands. Bueno, después de, eh, como 
Eh, muchos conocerán la situación que se vive hoy en nuestro país, Colombia. Quisiera también expresar una voz de solidaridad a todas las familias de todos estos líderes que hoy no queremos mencionar en cifras, pero que también han sido víctimas de esta violencia que se vive y que no cesa en nuestro país, tanto en el centro como en el sur del país, que es donde se vive de manera más aguda el asesinato de líderes sociales, por defender el territorio, por defender esto que nosotros consideramos hace parte de nuestra vida. A ellos también nuestra voz de solidaridad. Y bueno, hablar de los impactos de la, de la minería y del extractivismo en nuestro territorio, como lo ven en el mapa, eh, mi territorio o esta zona donde yo me ubico en el departamento de La Guajira, al norte de Colombia, tenemos muchas riquezas, ¿no? Pero riquezas que se han traducido en empobrecimiento para nuestro pueblo. Riquezas como nuestro viento, eh, nuestro sol, la ubicación geográfica, estratégica de, de, de La Guajira, carbón, eh, sal, todas estas y otros tipos de eh, minerales que se encuentran presentes en el territorio hacen que este sea un territorio muy apetecido y considerado pues de interés nacional para la extracción de los recursos que aquí se encuentran. En el territorio Guayú tenemos alrededor de más de 30 años de tener un muy mal vecino que es eh, la empresa Cerrejón de la cual es propietaria y su gran mayoría accionista una de las eh, grandes corporaciones mundiales, transnacionales, Glencore, eh, es una de las dueñas de esta empresa y es una empresa por la, con la cual hemos venido batallando tanto comunidades como procesos organizativos frente a todos los impactos y los daños que ha ocasionado en el territorio. Hablar de estos daños es de todo tipo, ¿no? estamos hablando de un daño social, de un daño económico, eh, hay un daño que eh, difícilmente eh, el gobierno colombiano, y creo que muchos gobiernos no lo pueden entender a donde hay pueblos indígenas, y es el daño cultural que se viene eh, efectuando a nuestros pueblos. Y este daño cultural nos lleva a otro daño que es el impacto a la espiritualidad, y esto también cómo impacta de manera diferencial a la vida de las mujeres indígenas. Entonces yo creo que todo este tema de impactos, la negación de derechos por parte de los estados que se ocasiona frente cuando encontramos eh, estados que son permisivos con las empresas transnacionales, y que no garantizan los derechos de los pueblos indígenas, como es el caso eh, del Estado colombiano frente a la garantía de derechos de nuestros pueblos. Entonces creo que todas este, estas amenazas y todos estos impactos que encontramos en nuestros pueblos, solamente lo ponemos frenar pues, con esto que nosotros llamamos la resistencia y la defensa del territorio. Femme. <laughs> okay, so uh, my territory is in the Guajira. There's, it's a, an area that's very rich in natural resources. Unfortunately, that richness in natural resources doesn't translate in the same way for our people. So even though we have, you know, it actually translates into poverty for our people and impoverishes our nations because it's all taken away from us. So the wind, the sun, um, the geographical location it's a, it's located in a in a very um uh strategic geographical location we have access to coal salt and many other types of minerals um so it, it becomes very palatable for extractive industry we have been fighting for 30 over 30 years um to um, make sure that our ancestral lands are not taken away by uh mainly an organization a company called uh, the Cerrejón coal mine the transnational uh, Glencore Corporation. And um, we've been fighting as communities to keep this company outside of our lands. Um, however, it's been very, very difficult to continue doing that. Um, you know, as part of the issues that we see, it's also uh, not just a access to land and access to our, our sacred sites. Um, but it, it translates to a cultural, um, cultural loss of culture for our peoples. It translates to loss of spirituality for our peoples. And um, we see that it's a permissive state and permissive government policies that favor transnational corporations over the rights of indigenous peoples and over the lands of indigenous peoples. I also have to say, that, and I'm sorry, she said this at the very beginning before speaking of the Guajira, um, that this is all in the context of um, Colombia as a country um, being one of the 
an, an area of conflict, a conflict zone being an area where there is extreme levels of violence, where um, there are many social leaders that are killed on a daily basis and have been killed even in spite of the signing of peace accords in 2016. Um, I won't say in numbers how many people have died and continue to die, particularly in the, in the middle area of the country. However, I will say that we raise our voice in solidarity um, with all of the people that have lost the loved ones. Um, and we also continue to lose our loved ones in our lands. Bueno, yo creo que esta es una oportunidad también que eh, las organizaciones, los procesos de resistencia, la voz de las mujeres, desde cualquier rincón del mundo tenemos que seguir levantando nuestras voces porque lo que nosotros eh, y nosotras, lo que hemos venido diciéndole al mundo frente a este discurso de hipocresía de los estados frente al tema del cambio climático, y el no querer reconocer realmente cuál es la causa de estos, de, de estos cambios que eh, la madre naturaleza nos está mostrando. En La Guajira, hace tres días, tuvimos un temblor de 5.8 grados y su epicentro fue el lugar a donde está la mina del Cerrejón. Y desde la sabiduría ancestral, lo que decimos los pueblos es que el cambio climático tiene que cambiar su manera de contarle al mundo realmente cuáles son sus verdaderas causas. En la medida en que vamos sacándole el vientre a la madre tierra, vamos sacando todos sus órganos, vamos sacando toda su fuerza espiritual, esto es lo que nos va a cobrar la naturaleza, esto es lo que nos va a cobrar la madre tierra. Y esta situación que estamos viendo, que nos quieren disfrazar como cambio climático, no es más que la consecuencia de estas violencias, de esta forma voraz de poder... Eh, sacar y de poder robar nuestros recursos, de poder extraer de manera eh, casi que eh, no hay palabras como que decir de toda esta manera vil de violentar los territorios bajo un discurso de la economía nacional. ¿no? Entonces la economía nacional, en el caso de Colombia, por ejemplo, Colombia es un país que su matriz energética es a través de eh, energía hidroeléctrica. Todo el carbón que se saca en Colombia, por ejemplo, se saca de la Guajira y es un carbón que se exporta en su totalidad, no se usa en el país. Pero el daño que va dejando en nuestros territorios es desolador. Nosotros estamos en una zona de una fragilidad hídrica, una zona semidesértica, y lo que estamos viendo es que el agua cada vez es más escasa, pero la empresa eh, no, puede, no reconoce, el Estado colombiano no reconoce que la actividad extractiva tiene unos daños irreversibles en, en el ambiente, en todo lo que tiene que ver con el acceso al, al líquido vital como es el agua. Y frente a eso, las luchas de las comunidades, eh, el encontrarnos frente a un enemigo pues, gigantesco, nos invita cada vez más a la alianza, a la articulación, al escuchar estas voces que es tan importante desde cualquier latitud del mundo, porque esto también nos llena de esperanza, también nos llena de esa energía que necesitamos para poder seguir en este proceso de resistencia. Y la resistencia es de distintas formas, ¿no? Desde la voz de las mujeres, articulándonos, eh, haciendo pues como esta estrategia política, entender también que hay una estrategia jurídica que debe ir de la mano de la, de la estrategia política, usar las herramientas comunicativas, la alianza con la academia, yo creo que la academia tiene una responsabilidad muy grande frente al cómo contar realmente, y que lo científico no puede seguirse sobreponiendo al conocimiento tradicional, eso hace parte como de este mundo de las resistencias, esta lucha permanente contra la impunidad, la impunidad que generan los estados frente a las políticas que se, que se tornan tan laxas frente a la, al poder corporativo internacional. So I think resistance is the only way forward um, as organizations, the what, raising the voice of women. Um, it's the only way to really combat the hypocrisy and the, dual, the double speak around climate change. Um, three days ago, there was a 5.8 earthquake that was registered in Colombia in the um, area close that was actually at the heart of the mine of, of the Cerrejón. Um, so one thing that we say is that um, climate change has to change how we understand the world because we are taking away the spiritual, well, not we, but the corporations that are doing this extractive industries, taking away the spiritual strength in the organs of Mother Earth. 
right? There's no other way to say this, but there's hunger and there's a robbery and a theft of our natural resources. It's a rape and a violation of the earth. And it's all under the guise of a national economy. For Colombia, hydroelectric power um, is one of the main sources of um, our economy and it fuels our own, our coal industry. But all of the coal that is mined is all exported. It doesn't stay here in Colombia. It all goes outside of the country. So even in terms of our national economy, it's a weak excuse. Um, there's also this type of mining is happening in, a, in an area that has a fragility of access to water. The Guajira is a semi-desert area, uh, much like the southwest of the United States. Um, so access to water has been an ongoing issue for our community. And when you have corporations like the Cerrejón that are using hydroelectric electric power to fuel their coal mining, um, that is something that uh, the corporation just doesn't understand how they're impacting lives and how extractive industry impacts access to this basic liquid of life. As um, organizers in a resistance, we're facing a giant of an enemy, you know, but in some ways this also pushes us into understanding that this is a struggle that crosses into many different latitudes worldwide. It's a resistance that causes us to join forces with other women it's a resistance that causes us to join forces with other peoples. It's something that causes us to realize that there has to be a legal strategy and a political strategy that go hand in hand, that academia has to go hand in hand and has an important role to play, that science also has an important role to play, although it can't be the dominating voice and it can't be the only voice, particularly when we talk about our own ancestral and traditional knowledge. Bueno, gracias, Natalie. Eh, por último, también quiero decir que, bueno, podríamos tomarnos mucho tiempo aquí a hablar de los problemas, de las afectaciones, de todas las situaciones tan complicadas que viven nuestros pueblos, hablando de la negación de derechos, del acceso al agua, de niños que muan, mueren de desnutrición en nuestras comunidades, de mujeres, de familias completas que... Eh, en el caso particular del de, eh, pueblo Guayú, en los últimos 10 años han muerto alrededor de 7,000, 8,000 niños por física hambre. Por física hambre porque no tenemos agua, porque tenemos un gobierno irresponsable frente al poder corporativo. Pero en el medio de toda esta situación también tenemos que decir que hay esperanza, ¿no? De que escuchar la voz de mujeres como ustedes, escuchar procesos que de comunidades que siguen apostándole a la vida, que siguen defendiendo el territorio. Creo que eh, a eso también tenemos que apuntar en tiempos aún más difíciles. Yo pienso y creo que los pueblos indígenas no salimos de una situación difícil para entrar en otra. ¿no? Entonces ahora ha llegado eh, una pandemia, un virus, que es igual de violento contra los territorios, contra las mujeres, contra la economía, contra todo, ¿no? pero sobre todo contra la vida eh, de las comunidades más vulnerables. Entonces, frente a eso también tenemos que eh, dar la voz de esperanza, tenemos que armar también, fortalecer esas estrategias de lucha que siempre hemos tenido, fortalecer nuestras alianzas. Si la virtualidad hoy es una oportunidad, pues también tendremos que apostar a cómo realmente logramos nuevas formas, nuevas garantías de poder acceder eh, a estas nuevas formas pero hay una realidad en las comunidades y es que eh, el acceso a, a estos medios, por ejemplo, es, es bastante complicado. Pero creo que eh, con relación a eso, quienes estamos, quienes conocemos, quienes tenemos pues como eh, esta valentía hoy después de haber superado muchísimas situaciones violentas contra nuestras vidas, porque en Colombia eh, quien defiende la vida es amenazado y es asesinado. Y creo que eso también nos tiene que permitir mucha más fuerza para poder continuar, porque hoy, en medio de esta pandemia, las responsabilidades siguen creciendo. Y hay una responsabilidad muy grande, y es que tenemos que ayudar a quitar este manto de miedo que tiene la gente, este manto de miedo que se nos ha inyectado, porque entonces ya es difícil salir, ya es difícil encontrarnos, ya no podemos hacerlo, porque entonces hay una ley, hay una norma que si te reprime de una forma, ahora he encontrado una forma más fácil de reprimirte y de poder silenciarte y no pasa nada. 
porque eh, esto también creo que hace parte también de las estrategias globales de los poderes corporativos para poder callar las voces de las comunidades frente a las reclamaciones históricas que hemos tenido. There's a lot that we could say about problems um, and that we could talk about the lack of rights. Um, you know, in terms of the Guajira region, uh, there's a lack of nutrition for children, for women, um, lack of access to water. Um, in the past decade, we've had, we've lost 7,000 to 8,000 children um, because of lack of water. Um, you know, and, and we could, we could talk uh, for a long time about all of these issues, but I, I want to say that I am hopeful and that I think that this type of gathering really makes me hopeful and it makes me realize that there is hope and we have to bet on life um, and, and to really, um, as women, as indigenous women, as indigenous people, um, we have to lean uh, and work with one another um, the pandemic is also something that is causing us to realize that it's a violent attack against the most vulnerable populations. It's also impacted our indigenous territories. But as part of facing that, we have to continue to fortify the alliances that we have and continue to build alliances. In some ways, um, this has allowed us to understand the importance of even these type of virtual gatherings and um, but we also have a challenge of, you know, once this is over, how do we do this in a new way? How can we continue to build the, um, the alliances that we are starting to build through, vir through these virtual connections? Um, you know, and even in terms of virtual connections, access to this type of technology is also an issue for our communities. So um, here in Colombia, if you defend life, uh, you're likely to be threatened or you're likely to be killed. So it's one of the realities um, of, and a responsibility of being a defender here in this country. Um, however, we also have to lift that mantle of fear um, and remove that cloak of fear because that's also part of a global strategy of domination. Natalia, muchísimas gracias. Yo creo que dejaría hasta ahí mi participación y también quiero seguir escuchando preguntas, inquietudes que tengan en el panel. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias, Jacqueline. And thank you so much. Um, she just wants, just wants to thank everybody and um, she will stay on as well in case there are questions um, that, and wants to continue listening as well. So thank you. Jordan, you can take it away. Thank you, Jacqueline. Gracias. Um, do any, I don't see any questions pending in the chat yet. Well, there's one, the most recent one. I also wanted to invite the panelists to ask questions or make comments of the other if they have any, anything extra to say or add or question from others' presentations. I actually just wanted to um, say briefly, you know, just I feel very empowered um, by having all these incredible women on this panel today. Um, y muchísimas gracias también, Jacqueline, por estar con nosotras hoy y con nosotros hoy. Uh, quería decir de que me siento muy, muy eh, honrada de también tenerlas a todas ustedes en este día. Um, I think that one thing that um, you know, it's, it's this global narrative that we see over and over again that extractive industry has, uh, continues to, to plunder our lands across the world. And I think that one thing that I'm very, very thankful for um, in listening to the different voices that we've heard is that there's still so much to learn. There's still struggles that are not visible enough. There's still things that we need to continue fighting for, that there is, you know, there can't be, um, as we say in Spanish, no hay cansancio, right? Like there's, there, we can't be tired. We can't stop fighting because it's something that um, they don't stop. So we can't stop. And I know that sometimes that um, is difficult because we are human and we do get tired. But I think that it's really uplifting to see other women and other people that are fighting and continue to fight. So I wanted to say thank you. 
y lo voy a traducir, eh, simplemente quería decir que para mí es también un símbolo de esperanza de ver que podemos seguir luchando y que tenemos que seguir luchando a pesar del cansancio, ¿no? Decir que no hay cansancio, aunque también somos humanos y humanas y hay cansancio a veces, pero que en realidad es algo que me, me llena de mucha fuerza y de mucha esperanza al saber de que hay personas que siguen luchando y que hay también una necesidad de seguirlo haciendo porque hay todavía luchas que no son visibles y que son invisibilizadas. Entonces, eh, ese era el, el único comentario que quería hacer y abrirlo ahora para, para preguntas. So, with that, I'll, I'll continue to open it to, to questions. Any of the panelists have any other questions? I have several, but I don't want to take up all the time. Um, I just wanted to add a couple words. Uh, So um, I, I did a very quick presentation and I think something I said earlier was, um, I'm sorry about that. We, I've, I started my work uh, with my people um, on Navajo um, and, I, and, and, that, and that was something that taught me how to go forward. More recently um, with the nuclear waste issue, the, the expertise is um, really, um, has accumulated in older white men. And so I find myself working mostly with um, Bilaganas or white people. So for the last six years, I've been, I've been working mostly with non-natives and it's, it's really hard for me as an indigenous person to, 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 to do this. However, it's, it's a really interesting thing that um, There hasn't been this transmission of information and expertise, especially to the people of color and then the most impacted. And, and I'm just curious, I don't know how that is. Um, and, and especially for like um, legal stuff. So for example, I think one of the first questions I had when I first met Jordan was if he knows a lawyer who is specialized in dealing with like um, uh, tribal sovereignty or Um, how, how to utilize the indigenous nations in the United States with our, with our status as quasi-sovereign nations to, to stop transport of radioactive waste and things like that. I imagine it's much harder in Colombia and Latin America because of, I don't think they have the same kind of um, status as our, our people up here. But I'm just curious how the um, National Lawyers Guild operates to make sure there is, I, I, I know you have the Indigenous Caucus. Um, I was very honored to attend one meeting, but I'm just curious how you all make sure that there is that transmission of expertise, especially um, in the nuanced um, areas of law that you are all dealing with. And then how does that, um, how do you build that if you are doing that in native communities? I'm having this problem right now in my work because because of the lack of uh, involvement from EJ people, you know, indigenous people and then people across the board, like I said, it's mostly all older white folks. So, so I'm curious, how, how do you all um, rectify this or ensure that, you know, you are, besides having these kinds of talks here, like when you get down to the, the, the real work um, and the legal fights, maybe Le Leola knows because she's been involved with this. I don't know, that's my question is how do you all you know, get, get the information and, and, and expertise transmitted to the folks who need it the most so we can defend ourselves. I can, I'm going to start on some of that. I think what you're, what you're noticing is just one of the issues of legal education in the United States of America, right? If you look at how many Indian people go to law school, pass the bar, and start practicing federal Indian law and energy resource accountability, you're looking at probably less than, 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 like, like obviously 1%, you know? I mean, it's, there, there's just not a lot of Indian people who are, one, going to law school. And then two, if you look at all of the law schools, and what they're teaching, right? You only have so many law schools that are even teaching federal Indian law, right? So we're producing lawyers 
that don't know federal Indian law, that don't get tested federal Indian law on their bar admissions, right? So the whole legal infrastructure itself is not created to sustain or support indigenous liberation. So like, I feel like the legal education system itself is one of replication, is one to protect the status quo, right? And so I feel like with our generation and the generation I feel that we're standing on as indigenous peoples, um, we've really tried to change law and change that colonial legal regime as best that you can. But also I feel like at least at the University of Arizona, um, with the program that we're creating at the Indigenous um, Human Rights Defenders and Corporate Accountability Program, that we are going to educate um, within that program, hopefully a generation of legal warriors that will start asking those exact questions. Um, but I feel like one of the reasons why we're able to do that is because we're doing it as an Indigenous-led kind of legal adv advocacy group. And I feel like if we, want that type of lawyer, we have to start like nurturing and growing that lawyer from a very young age and finding ways to support that person in getting to law school, going to law school, and then also finding those mentors that are going to be, you know, willing to teach the younger generation. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely concerned as well it even within the federal Indian law world about how we are going to be passing the baton from you know my mentors on right because there's just not a lot of there's not a lot of us um so the I hope you know from 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 folks like you and myself and the NLG and everyone that we can put pressure on the whole legal education to start producing lawyers that are actually going to be serving the people and, and supporting people of color in that, in that journey, you know? And I just think that right now, you know, legal education is, has been one that has been colonial too. And so we don't learn liberation in law school or, or how to sustain legal infrastructure in a revolution, you know? Um, so I think we're really trying to do a lot of new things and, um, that's what I can say for the U of A, but uh, I'm not, I can't speak for NLG. And I can speak a little bit to NLG, Fiona. I am the current chair of the Indigenous Peoples Rights Committee. However, um, I think it's a, it's a committee that is still growing in many ways and is still finding itself in many ways. Um, it has been focused, I think, in the past few years on international solidarity and a lot of, um, there's a lot of work that the Guild does as a whole um, that touches on a lot of issues that impact um, Indigenous peoples across the world. But I do think that um, the issue that you're talking about, right, in terms of transference of, of information, and how you, how you build a new generation, I think that's something that we've discussed even within the Guild um, for many years as uh, how do we do that generally, even with um, as lawyers that are, um, you know, in, in radical lawyering and are lawyers that are uh, pushing the status quo in a different direction, you know, so I think that there's, it's like kind of a multi-tiered question because I think like Michelle said, you know, there's a lot of issues with even just the replication of knowledge. And I think, um, I think it's Joey Chase um, has a comment here in the chat and he says federal Indian law was canceled my last two years of law school and law school in general is about turning out soldier of capital. And I have to agree with that. You know, I went to Arizona State University Law School and I was really fortunate to learn under Professor Rebecca Sosi, who is um, an incredible member of, um, you know, as a professor of, the, of academia and has written extensively on indigenous sovereignty and on issues of natural resources. Um, but even then we had one class on international indigenous rights, you know, in one of the premier institutions in the country and one of the leading institutions um, with respect to federal Indian law with an Indian legal program. We had all of eight students in the Indian legal program. Um, I was one of two, 
one of eight indigenous students in the in my entire law school class and one of two Latinas in my in, entire law school class. So it was kind of a, it, it's a very alienating um, uh, profession in some ways, right? The other day um, I went down with a, another attorney that has just been admitted to the bar and she was going in for her federal admission to federal court and um, I was there with another attorney from my firm and we were there as sponsors. And it was really interesting because the judge was asking so many questions to this um, young attorney. And I just remember feeling like this is very surreal. It's a, it's a surreal feeling to be in a federal court of the United States, you know, and I've practiced in different courts, but every time I'm in court, you know, it is one of the, it is a surreal feeling because ultimately um, it's like the book, we're in the courts of the conqueror, you know, it is a colonial system. It is, um, you do see the replication of colonial structures over and over again. I like to call them legal fictions because they're things that we've taught ourselves and that we've indoctrinated ourselves with in within this, you know, box of understanding. And I really appreciate people like Michelle, like yourself, you know, that are like Viola, that like Jacqueline, that are really pushing the boundaries of the law um, through activism, right? And I think that that's something that if I can take away from what a common theme has been in this panel is that that resistance is what pushes things forward. And I think we're seeing that generally, but in terms of how to actually, you know, um, create like a new generation, I think it's hard. I think it starts from like very, you know, I think it's also even just seeing how many people we have access to, right? The role models that we can look up to, if there are people that um, we can speak to. And, and the same thing is I've found incredible mentors within the Lawyers Guild um, that have taken me under their wing as a young attorney and even as a law student that were willing to teach me. But sometimes that wasn't always easy, right? Sometimes it also required me to be the little, the person like asking questions and the person interested in, in learning from other people. So I think it's kind of a two way street, but I think that if we do um, approach people with the kind of, you know, we wanna learn and people are willing to give of their time, I think that, that whether that's as, a, as, as law students or as activists or as young attorneys, um, I think that those are things that we, we will find um, but obviously it's, it's something that we also need from, um, and it's hard too, because we kind of start talking about like, what does that look like, right? Just do we lose any of that indigeneity when we are talking to friends or folks or, or that are, that are not necessarily indigenous persons, um, however, our allies, um, and is there always, you know, I, I have often conversations with Jordan about, you know, a plethora of issues and I think we have pretty real conversations. So I think it's also just finding like people that you're safe um, in, in having conversations with that can be very difficult conversations sometimes. So um, thank you for that question. I think that that's it's a difficult question to answer. Definitely if uh, you know folks that are interested in the law or that are studying law, send them our way in terms of the NLG. Um, and it's, it's kind of an ongoing process. Jordan, I'll let you continue moderating so I can translate in the typing box. Do you have any other questions from the crowd or from the participants? I think you have a few questions in the chat box. Um, let's see. Leona, do you see this question from Paul? You can read it. Yeah, thanks, Paul. So I'll just read it for everyone. Um, some climate activists are advocating nuclear power as a solution, some new plants and some just uh, keep the ones going that we have to make transition. Is, is there a way we can hold these proponents accountable to something like reparations to people affected by mining and producing the fuel and restoration of impacted land and nuclear waste? Um, yeah, this is a great question. Um, I think um, 
you know, there's at the moment, there is no direct like accountability uh, mechanism in place. Um, so I'm, I, I don't want to do a whole history lesson, but the, the, when, you're, when you're talking about uranium mining, so a lot of the past mining occurred when there was no regulations in place on cleanup and, um, you know, like uh, demanding, there was no law saying that the mining companies had to clean their water before discharging it or, you know, that they had to even close the mine. Um, so like I said earlier, with, there's 15,000 abandoned mines in the United States um, that, that, that are all over the place, mostly in the West. And um, there's no law in Congress to say to clean up those 15,000 abandoned uranium mines. There's some cleanup happening um, on Navajo Nation. Our, our, our government has been working with the federal government to do some cleanup. Um, a few years ago, some friends were trying to get a law in Congress passed or some kind of mechanism to clean up those 15,000 abandoned uranium mines. Um, at the, at, to, to, as of today, there's, there's nothing saying anything about those. But for new mines, of course, um, this is later on after those laws were, some were created. Um, uh, the companies generally get away with um, lax regulations. So they try, I mean, you can never fully clean out radiation 100%. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean, maybe, maybe in some, in some awesome labs, you can, you can get it pretty clean, but um, that's very expensive. And so when you're looking at the amount of contamination, you know, there's, there's no funding for, for that. We've had um, contamination in public water resources, like out in Navajo. Um, it was discovered in 2015, there was a community drinking, um, twice the legal level of uranium in their tap water. Um, that was in Sanders, Arizona. Um, so it, it's the only way these things change are by people doing the work themselves, getting involved. But I think, um, so for the uranium mining, I think um, the, the, the general uh, thing is like, we don't need more uranium mining. Um, there's enough uranium out of the ground right now there's about 100 or so power plants that have operated in the United States. Only two are moving forward. And these power plants, um, the two new ones are in Georgia. And it's, it's on delay, delay, delay. It's got it's millions of dollars over budget. Um, so in general, nuclear energy is making climate change worse. So nuclear energy takes funding away from renewables and, and other transition, you know, other, other mechanisms to transition away from fossil fuels. And uranium is not counted as a fossil fuel. I mean, technically it didn't have a, you know, it, it didn't form the way coal and oil did, but uranium is one of the oldest elements that helped to form the earth. So, I mean, it should be regarded in that same way because groups like Sierra Club and these big environmental groups they don't count uranium in part of their fight against fossil fuels and, and, and that, you know, this, this type of work. It's, as an anti-nuclear activist, our work is always marginalized um, within the environmental movement to the point where environmental advocates are saying nuclear is clean and renewable. Um, and the way that happens is the, the power plant where they create the electricity oftentimes emits just um, some steam from, because it's basically just a big uh, pot of boiling water and that's how they make the electricity. And so they don't, when they're calculating the carbon footprint of nuclear, they're only looking at that power plant. They don't count the uranium mining, the processing, all the transportation all over the world. And then after that uranium is processed into fuel and then it's, it's used in the power plant, the waste that's created, it's going to be radioactive for millions of years. And to store that waste safely is also going to take a lot of energy. So the back end has, is impossible to calculate how much um, energy it's going to take to safely store that waste forever. And so they just don't. So they just don't count it into the, uh, they'll, they'll, you know, calculate the decommissioning of the power plant. But the waste, that, that's what we're dealing with. That's what our fight is um, here in New Mexico. We're we're trying to stop the storage of waste here because the, there's nowhere to put it. And, and just, I wanted to add, um, so for everybody, if you can talk to your elected officials, if anyone is uh, in cahoots with AOC or Joe Biden, you know, we need to tell them 
nuclear has no place in, in, in transition. It is, it is not clean. It is not renewable. They're claiming that they can recycle the waste once um, to do reprocessing, but you can only do that once and it's very dirty. So I just wanted to add um, one last message to everyone out there. I don't know how many of you live near a railroad, but the idea, if you saw that map I showed earlier, basically they're gonna transport the waste from all these reactors in the east. You know, they took out the uranium in the west, they used it somewhere else, and now they're trying to bring the waste back to us um, by train. And so some of it would go by barge, probably, you know, around Florida and then port in Texas. But um, essentially it's all gonna be by railroad. So if any of you live near a railroad, um, you are also at risk because of this transport. It would take decades to move it. So anyone, if anyone has any questions, I'll put my um, email in the chat. And yeah, I, I think the thing is, if they counted the true carbon footprint of, of nuclear energy, they would see it's not, it's, it's not what the industry is saying. Like I actually have a study, I'll put a link in the chat for um, a study some folks did on the actual grams per um, kilowatt hour or whatever. So anyways, thanks for the question. I'll say that uh, I'm not sure if anyone else has anything to add. We're a little bit past our time at 8.30. We can go on a little longer, but I don't want to hold too, uh, these great panelists up too long. Um, I sort of had a question for Jacqueline. I don't know if Natalie can translate, is whether she's familiar or seen the movie, uh, the documentary Aluna of, of the Koji people in, of the Sierra Nevada that had a, that's a documentary online. I can put the link there. It also has a, predecessor from 20 years ago called From the Heart of the World, an elder, elder Brother's Warning, uh, talking about the relationships we have with the planet. I thought that was a very impactful movie. Um, also, I want to transition to, or make a read a comment that was put in the chat from a member of our committee, Lindsay Shroman Warren from Clallam Territory, it's Port Angeles, Washington area. Lindsay said, that in answer, to, in answer to your question, Leona, that law schools, law schools emerged with big law and corporate power during the Gilded Age. Yes, we need to decolonize them, but we also need to transform our collective legal knowledge towards a society where everyone has power in shaping the rules that govern our communities. And he said, see grassroots postmodernism and escaping education by Gustavo Estiva and Madhusuri Prakash. Um. Um, Go ahead. Can I, can I answer that? Interestingly enough, 10 years ago when I was in a much, much, much younger, I was able to go to Oaxaca and study with Gustavo Esteva about intercultural dialogue. And I learned so much from him. Um, and I'm happy that you mentioned his name um, because I haven't thought about him for quite a long time. But I think you know, how we approach law first. I, one, I think question everything, right? Be critical of everything, every movement, climate movement, question all of it. Um, but I think too, part of what we need to understand as advocates in the United States is that we already stand on law that existed here before the United, United States of America um, was formed. Right, and so for us, law is a part of our life that is also life affirming, right? And just because there is order doesn't mean that that is necessarily a hegemonic, oppressive institution based on, you know, patriarchy and extraction, right? And, and in fact, you know, indigenous peoples more than others, customary law and traditions do have that knowledge that can actually teach an alternative way of being and an alternative way of governance. And so one of the things that we're doing at the University of Arizona, um, and, and we're really following the critical work of, of Robert A. Williams Jr., is that we, we made a wampum belt um, with Wampanoag people here in the Northeast that is a replica and a story about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so, you know, for me, as someone who teaches at the University of Arizona, you know, how do we decolonize um, <clears throat> our pedagogy, right? And how do we start 
um, law from the beginning. And so I think looking back towards the indigenous legal systems and justice um, traditions is really to me where I think we should start um, as the basis of law um, in the United States, right? And, and of course you had all of the, you know, the first constitution even, you know, was a reflection of some of the indigenous legal systems that existed here. So I think it really just depends too on who the teacher is and how they create their programs. You know, as an indigenous woman, I feel like I approach my practice and that I approach how I want to teach legal education from an indigenous perspective. So that's part of the reason why we uh, constructed the belt as, as a emancipatory and critical decolonized indigenous pedagogy. Um, but I think it can be done and, and we'll see how it all turns out. I don't know, we'll see. We'll give it a minute to see if there's any other questions or responses. Here's a question from John Kuhn. Um, Jordan, I don't know if you want to read it. Give me one sec. How can we target sympathetic money into improving education and impact? Is that the end of the question you're talking about? Uh yeah, I'll just read it. I, it says, uh, John Kuhn, I'm an NLG member, an older white guy that is a lawyer and a PhD in natural resources and environmental studies. I would like to know from those who are local to the issues that are presented, how to invest money into places and issues that will make a difference. I'm a member of NLG and I represent victims of communications and I completely agree that our legal infrastructure ignores the sovereignty of Native American nations. How can we target sympathetic money into improving education and impact. Well, well, um, I think that, you know, there's, there's already, you know, I think one is supporting some of what already exists. So for example, there's the pre-law summer Institute for um, native Americans. It's a pre-law program that um, indigenous peoples can participate in to to prepare them for their first year of law school. Um, and that is a program where all of those students, um, many, many are what they would call non-traditional students. So, you know, needing additional funding for childcare or to support larger families. Um, and so some of those programs you can donate to. Um, I also think there's a lot of tribal scholarship programs um, generally uh, that provide um, indigenous students with um, uh, scholarships for their le legal education or, or for their general education. Um, but I think really, we, we really have to create those programs ourselves and we need to find more of them. There's not enough of them. Um, but I think those are some ways that, uh, that folks can make a good investment in, um, into, into some of that change. I'll say that that, to answer Leona's question from earlier, is that's, that's the process in the NLG, is trying to find the experts who are knowledgeable um, and trying to make that, that, that information plain and make it accessible to folks. Um, the person who held both Natalie and my position before us was Andy Reid. He was featured in our last webinar. Um, he mentioned in his webinar, the Barry Law School has a program on earth jurisprudence. So that's a, that's a possibility for trying to reframe some of the jurisprudence um, that, from what we're typically used to seeing in law school. And Yes, like like uh, John Cook just John Kuhn just mentioned is freeing up the resources. It's um, with the with the NLG, the National Lawyers Guild. At every convention, the biggest problem with accessibility is is funding. Trying to uh, provide funding, scholarships for people that'll just take the lighten the the economic burden on people being to access and to attend conventions and events. So I think a little bit goes a long way, a little generosity or a little decolonization of our committees and our organization. 
um, that form of reparations. If no one else has, if there's any other burning comments, otherwise we can uh, close this out. Thank you all. Thank you all very much for joining and participating. I think this is an awesome panel. We'll have it recorded. And we have one more webinar in two weeks. It's in our series of four web webinars and we really appreciate, appreciate you all participating. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you all. Thank you. All. Bye. Thank you. Uh, gracias, Jack.